Hey there, welcome to Spell. So this is a quick video tutorial demonstrating some of our key features in our end-to-end -end deep learning platform from training your model all the way to production ready deployment. And I'll be demoing this with the CIFAR 10 data set training and deploying a simple CNN classification model backed by our AWS account. You can follow along with all the code and all the steps here in our public Git repo, which I'll link here, as well as skip to different sections of this video if you're looking for something specific. All right, so let's get started. In order to use the Spell platform, Spell is going to require you to initialize your own cluster using your own cloud credentials. And I'll demonstrate here with AWS. The setup's pretty straightforward. So first of all, you're gonna need an AWS CLI installed as well as the credentials configured. You'll usually do this with some form of the AWS configure command. Uh, you can visit the AWS docs to see how to do this. Afterwards, you'll wanna install Spell. Uh, typically, if you're just the user in an organization that's already set up, you can simply do pip install Spell. And if you're the administrator who's configuring the cluster, you'll do pip install single quote Spell bracket cluster AWS. And this installs all the extra dependencies you're gonna to need to prepare for cluster initialization. Uh, on this machine, I've already done this, so we can begin by just logging into Spell. You'll do this with Spell login, and a web browser should pop up, and you should just grant access. Now we can start the initialization process with the command Spell cluster init AWS. And this starts an automated onboarding through the CLI. It'll ask you for a display name, which I'll just say spell demo. Uh, it'll ask you for the AWS profile. I'll use the default one. And now it'll tell you a bunch of things it's going to do. Set up an S3 bucket, a VPC, security groups, etc. So just read through this. And when you're ready, press Y to continue. <laughs> Lastly, it'll ask you for the name of an S3 bucket to create for run outputs. And I'll just use the default name here. Now this process will take a couple of moments, but Spell will create your VPC, do all the configurations. You might need to adjust your AWS permissioning as needed to make sure Spell has all the permissions to do this. But if you just give this a few seconds, you'll be done and ready to use the platform. Okay. So the last thing that we want to do is enable a GPU for use. The, the easiest way to do this is in the web console. First, I'm going to go to the web console, and I will navigate over to the clusters tab. So the clusters might take just a few seconds to refresh when you first configure a cluster. Here you go. Now, in this button that says Add New Machine Type, we'll click it, and I'll name my machine V100 and it's going to be a GPU. We're going to actually use the V100 instance. The rest of the settings I'll just leave by default, and you just press Create. All right, now you're totally ready to make runs on your GPU. OK, so most of the time, training a model is going to require three parts. First, you'll need your training code, and then you'll need that data set that you're training on, and then you'll have to finally specify a machine that will actually do the execution. Uh, in this example, I'll use a simple CNN classifier, a pre-written piece of code. And I'll train that on the raw CVAR10 data set on a V100 EC2 instance, which is just a type of GPU. Now, the first thing you want to do is prepare your data set for use. And this will happen in two steps. First, you'll need to get that data into SpellFS, which is our cloud file system for holding data sets for training. And then during execution, you'll need to bring that data set onto the actual VM instance you're running off of. And I'll show you both parts here. The easiest way to get your data set into SpellFS is to just first upload it to cloud storage, like a private S3 bucket. And then you can directly add that bucket to your Spell cluster. So I've already prepared a S3 bucket here with the original CIFAR 10 data that's from the University of Toronto website. And I can just add this to my spell cluster using spell cluster add bucket, which begins an automated process of adding this. Um, it'll ask you whether you're using the right access key. You can press yes. 
and then it'll list out all the buckets in your AWS account. And you can simply spell, select the one that you're, you're looking for. If you give it a couple of moments, it'll add this to your cluster. Um, the second step is to prepare your code. And here I'm just gonna clone a public Git repo of the CNN code that I've written beforehand. And feel free to, feel free to follow along. Um, the specific folder and the file that we're interested in is called it's in models and it's called train.py. Um, and so when you're actually writing your code, one thing that you'll need to do is specify where on the compute instance you're loading your data set. For example, in PyTorch, you would do this in the data loader function. Um, and so let me just show you what this code looks like. If you scroll down to the part where you're actually loading in your data, you'll see that it's loading from a directory called slash mnt slash cfar10. This is just an arbitrary directory that I've chosen for the code to look for when it's actually on the EC2 compute instance. What you have to do is tell spellfs to bring that data set you just added into this directory during runtime. All right, so let's put all of this together. You can actually just do all of this in a single command to begin your execution. And of course, it'll start with spell run. We'll do dash dash machine type v100, which means I want to use the v100 machine. Do dash dash mount and s3 slash spell demo cfar10 colon slash mnt slash cfar10. Um, and what this is saying is um, mount the data set from the S3 slash spell demo CFAR10 directory on the spell FS to the folder of the slash MNT slash CFAR10 on the actual EC2 instance, on the V100 instance. Right? Now the last thing you'll need to add is the actual command that the instance is going to run. So here I have a Python file. I'll just do python train.py. And then you just press enter and the magic kind of begins. Uh, what's kind of happening under the hood here is the spell run orchestrator is first syncing the contents of your local Git repo with spell. Secondly, it's spinning up a machine and it's setting up an Amazon machine image on that VM. So this will include the necessary dependencies that you'll need such as PyTorch or TensorFlow. It's then mounting that data set to spellfs, executing that code, and then saving the artifacts and outputs. Um, on your first run, like in this instance, usually there'll be a couple of minutes of startup time, just like if you would manually start an EC2 instance yourself. Um, of course, you can specify the idle time in your cluster configuration to reduce the wait time for multiple runs in a row. Now that the training has begun, you can see the run in action either directly here on the CLI, or you can go to the web console where you're actually gonna get just a little bit more um, metadata, right? You'll get some information on the repo, get commit hash, mounts, um, and you'll also see live user and hardware metrics streaming during the actual run itself. Lastly, you'll be able to just see the logs and download the logs if you need to. Now, oftentimes, you'll need to make more than one run. Uh, for example, you're trying to change the hyperparameters or the architecture of your model. And so remember that all of this is just running in the cloud. And I can just press Control C and have this run run remotely in the back. Um, and let me just begin a couple of new runs. So for example, in this default script, uh, I have it running at 20 epochs. And perhaps I'm interested in what that data looks like if I ran it with 10. And maybe I'll start another run where I run it with five. Now, if you go back to uncategorized runs, you'll see that at the top of the list, there are now three runs simultaneously starting and executing remotely.
Okay, so we've waited a little bit and now our runs have completed. And I really wanna know what were my results and what's actually the best model that I can use. So here you can see in the uncategorized runs tab, we have three finished runs at the top. And before I look into any of them, I typically like to do a little bit of organization. So I'll click the three that I'm interested in organizing and I'll press the projects button. The projects button is really just a way to get your runs into a specific directory. Right? And when you look in the projects tab and click on the specific project, you'll see that it gives you some options to create a description, add some key metrics, and really just list all the runs that are part of that project, right? Now the second step here is um, when I'm deep diving on the metrics, I really like to use our experiments feature. Oftentimes in a project, you're gonna have hundreds of runs and maybe you're only interested in a subset. So here, let me select just these three runs that I wanna really deep dive and I'll press experiment and create new experiment. So the, the two questions I'm really trying to answer when I look at these runs is first, which run actually gave me the best model? Uh, so in other words, which run gave me the lowest validation loss? And then the second question I'm trying to answer is, okay, then in that run that gave me the lowest validation loss, at what point did it have that lowest loss? At what epoch, right? So first, let me look a little bit at the loss itself, which I can do with an add columns, select metric, I'll select validation loss. The aggregation method here is minimum. This just means over time for each of these runs, I wanna know what the minimum loss was that it hit over all the epochs, right? I'll click create. And here I can see that run 1000, the last one here, has the lowest validation loss. Now to answer that second question, uh, where in run 1000 did it hit that lowest point? Uh, I typically like to visualize this, right? So I'll do add chart. I'll do single metric over time, which is, in other words, validation loss over time. The metric is still validation loss, scale is linear, scope is index, which means your X axis is gonna be epochs rather than time. Now let's press create chart. You can see here that if I just graph the last run, um, it gives you this very sort of expected uh, curve shape. Uh, and this is, this is normal, right? So the model is getting a lower validation loss as it trains on more data, but at some point the loss starts going back up as the model starts overfitting the training data, right? Um, and if I just glance at it, it's about uh, epoch 10, right? This is a zero, zero index, so epoch 10. So now I wanna actually mark that and put this in my model registry. I wanna say, okay, at epoch 10, that's the model I, I wanna use. So in order to do that, we can first click on the run and then we'll go to actions, create model. Here, let me quickly name my model. I'll just name it CFAR 10 demo. In this files area, when spell makes a run, all of the run outputs and artifacts are gonna be in this runs directory under the run ID in spell FS. And within this run ID, in my code, I've specified to make a directory called models. And then in that, make a directory called checkpoints. And then at every five epochs or so, I'll output the serialized PyTorch model. So you can see here, there's one for epoch 10. I'll select this one and I'll just simply press create model. And now my model's created and it's in the model registry. You can see a ton of metadata about the model and you can see also information about the lineage, which run it came from, what the repo was, what the spell command was. If you go to the models button on the left-hand tab, you'll see the whole list of our model registry. And every time you update a model with a better run or a better model, it'll automatically update its version. Okay, so after selecting a model for use, I want to actually serve that model in production. So Spell supports deployment backed by a managed Kubernetes cluster that's either EKS or GKE, depending on your underlying cloud provider. You're going to get all the scalability features typically found in a Kubernetes setup. I already know which model I want to use, but I need to specify what's called a serving script, essentially that says what's happening at inference time. We 
directly do this in the code using spell Python API. And let me show you an example that I've pre-written that's in the examples repo. Uh, so the code you want to look for is in the servers folder and it's called serve video demo. The first class defined in the code is just defining your model architecture. Um, we've inlined it for simplicity, but we recommend that you actually create a model module and just import it instead. Now, if you scroll down, you'll see that there's this predictor class, and this is the serving script part. The class requires that you inherit base predictor, and you fill out two functions. The first function is init. Uh, which is any setup you need to do before inference. Here we specify the model to be loaded in, uh, the transforms to be done on the data, and since this is a CNN classifier, we also define the classification labels. The second function is this predict function, which is parameterized by a payload or the sample that the request is sending in when it's hitting your endpoint. And here, uh, what we've done is in this example is just take this image make it into a tensor, do the pre-processing, and then send it through the neural net and give the output a, a label, right? You can look at this, de this code in a little more detail in our repo, but let me just show you now how to run the serving model. The command that you want to do is spell server surf. Um, and first, you'll call out the model name, which you had defined in the model registry, as well as the version. Then you'll specify the serving script that we just looked at. Now Spell will begin actually creating and setting up the deployment server. In the web console, you can see this starting up. If you click in, you'll see a bunch of server details, a bunch of performance details, uh, metrics, and logs. So usually this will take a couple minutes to start up, so let's just give it a second. All right, so after your model server is deployed, your endpoint is ready to use, and it's defined by this URL here. So I'm going to give you a quick example of how to use this endpoint, and let's try to actually classify a picture. Um, the picture that I want to try is this cat picture we have here, and you can find both the sample code as well as this picture in the server slash example request folder. All right, so let's look at this code real quick for us sending this request. First, what I want to do is remove this line that raises an exception because it's going to ask you to modify the request parameters a little bit. Now, in this request, uh, you want to actually enter in the URL of your model server. So first, I want to put my org name. Here, I'm using our spell external AWS org. And then you want to replace it with your server name. So mine is cfar 10 demo And now you're ready to go. So I'm going to run this request script. And it'll return the JSON of 